We're going to continue this morning with uh, the church of Sardis. Uh, it's in Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Now, all the, all the other churches, the, the other six churches, some receive mild rebukes, some receive uh, commendations. Uh, two of them don't really receive any condemnation at all. But Sardis, uh, Jesus really nails them hard. Ladies and gentlemen, the church of Sardis is not a church that we want to look like, okay? So make sure you understand that. We don't want to look like this church. And I don't think we do, so don't, don't read into that. But this church, uh, Sardis, uh, it, it was a somewhat of a wealthy city. It wasn't as important or quite as wealthy as some of the other cities that we've, or uh, some of the other churches and cities that we've talked about thus far. Um, but it had a lot of trade routes, so of course they did a lot of trading there, and they had uh, some similar things uh, to our other cities. Uh, the, there wasn't anything super special about this city in particular that made it stand out. Uh, it was just a city uh, that was, uh, it was fairly, fairly heavily populated, but like I said, nothing just made it stood out to, uh, to be, hey, we have to make this a required destination. Uh, but just a couple things about the city. Uh, number one, they believe that modern coinage was invented here. So I guess if it has its claim to fame, maybe this was it. Um, another thing is that uh, something that we might want to take notice of is that this particular church uh, had a, uh, a cooperation with uh, the Jews in this city and with its uh, pagan neighbors. Now that's something that we haven't really seen in the other cities or the other churches that we've studied thus far. It, it appears that the, the other churches, uh, they were always, uh, uh, the churches were fighting with the Jews or the Jews were uh, persecuting the, the church and of course the pagans uh, would do that. But here it seemed like they had sort of a, uh, a good coexistence. And normally when you have a good coexistence like that, that means there's compromise somewhere. Uh, because if you're truly following the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to be able to compromise uh, with uh, some of these things. So uh, maybe that's something to, to look at there. But uh, just to give you an idea how the, uh, the Jewish presence was there in this city, uh, the, they had built a synagogue right beside of one of the uh, pagan gymnasiums that was the size of a football field. And that's, that's a pretty good size synagogue, isn't it? Uh, that was highly unusual uh, to, to build something like that right next to uh, a pagan gymnasium, but they did. So that, that shares a little insight about how the Jews got along with their pagan neighbors as well. Uh, but one thing that, uh, as I've said, is Jesus doesn't mention any persecution among this church, so that might give us an idea that this church may have been compromised. Uh, so, again, something we just want to look out for. Well, let's begin here. Let's get into the Word this morning. I uh, just want to show you a couple quick pictures. I like to do that just to show you kind of what, uh, what it looks like over there, uh, what remains of it anyway. Just give you an idea. And uh, this here, this was, uh, um, this part down here, this was a uh, tile floor, you know, that was very ornamental and things like that. And, uh, you know, these are some pretty cool things about the city, but... Um, the good stuff is what we're getting to now. Verse 1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. This first part of the verse, we're going to come back to that in just a moment, but just to give you an idea of kind of what he's talking about there, it, it pretty much is referencing the, the, the seven spirits and the seven stars uh, was something that was also described in chapter 1 as well as uh, with the other churches that we've talked about thus far. But we're going to come back to it, and it, it pretty much is just referencing authority and power. So just keep that in mind, but we're going to come back to that shortly. Now when you read this, when you hear those first words, or this, this first verse, it's the words of him, the seven spirits, God, the seven stars, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. What's your first impressions? What's your first thoughts about this? 
Any takers? Nope. Okay. Well, Jesus says he knows their works. If you're not doing the right thing, that should always scare you to death. But he says he knows their works. Now, we know that they're doing works, but Jesus is rebuking them. Why is he rebuking them? Huh? Come on, now, you're, you're starting to come out now. Let me get you out of your shell. Come on. All right. Let me ask you this question. Can a church look busy on the outside but be spiritually dead on the inside? Okay, I'm glad you're with me there. I'm glad you're talking now. Here's a case of a church who might have just been going through the motions. Have you ever, have you ever found yourself possibly coming to church and maybe thinking, man, this is just so routine? Have you ever thought that? I'm going to be honest, I have. Yeah. When I was younger, I did. But even as I got older, even in my 20s, before I got saved, there were times when I felt like, you know, this is just routine. And I felt like I was just going through the motions. Now, you know, I was busy doing things. You know, I was, there were times where I'd read my Bible. You know, I'd, if the doors were open, we would go to church. You know, we tried to participate, tried to do different things. We were kind of busy. We are busy bodies. But we, that's all we were. We were just busy. There was really nothing substantial about what we were doing. Everything kind of felt routine. We were just going through the motions. And I assure you, Jesus knew our works. Jesus tells them, you have this reputation of being alive, but you are dead. What an indictment. What an indictment by Jesus himself. You know, a lot of times, for many churches, this is the reason that they refuse to accept any kind of change. Well, let me explain that. Many churches, they remember their heyday. They remember when everybody kind of came to church and it didn't feel like routine. It felt like everybody was pitching in. It felt like everybody was working hard for the Lord. It felt like everything was going great. You could feel the Spirit of the Lord before you ever walked in this place. And a lot of people remember that. They had that mindset about the way it used to be. And so when they get to the present time and it's not quite like it used to be, they like to hold on to the remembrance of how it used to be. And a lot of times, that is the very reasoning why change doesn't occur in some churches. But the problem isn't that they remember it. It's great to remember those times. But the problem isn't that they remember it. It's they've forgotten how they got to that point in the first place. If you go back and look at that heyday, you look at that time where things were going great, it looks where everybody's working together, people have forgotten what they did to get to that point. People worked hard. People were in tune with, the, with one another. People loved the Lord, and they were willing to work hard. They were willing to be patient with one another. They were willing to work with one another. Isn't that, isn't that something today, getting people in the church just to work together? Or getting, God forbid this, if churches work together. Aren't we all part of one body, one body of Christ? Aren't we all supposed to be working together? Well, there was a time when churches did that. There was a time when people did that, and people forget what they did to get to that point. Perhaps this is a church, this church of Sardis, perhaps that's where they were. They forgot how they got started. They forgot that point where they were doing things well. Here's a quote. I love this quote. 
y'all have heard me say it a time or two. It's important to remember our spiritual heritage, but not in vomit. Sometimes we get too caught up with other things, and we forget what we did at first. We forget that, that longing and that loving for the Lord. We forget that part of it, but we just want to remember it. But for those who remember all those good times, those heydays, for those of you who might remember when these, these pews were full, think about what was going on. Think of the hard work that went into making them full. Think of that. What were y'all doing then? Were you just going through the motions? I doubt it. I bet there's a couple people that might be able to answer this question I'm, I'm fixing to ask. Does anyone know the history of how this church started? Okay, Joan does. What about Phil? Do you know S somewhat? All right, so let me ask another few questions here. Do you think that this church was founded because they wanted some place just to socialize? Do you think this place was established so that they could educate? Because that's why a lot of churches started off as being educators. Do you think that that's why they established this place, just to educate? They did. And we should be proud of that. We should be glad of that. Uh, what about, uh, here's one. Do you think they established this place just to provide another place for Quakers to call home? I can guarantee you that every, that the people who started this, established this church, I can guarantee you they would have answered no to all of those questions. They would have answered no to all of those questions. The people who established this church, they established it because they had a heart and they wanted to reach people for the Lord Jesus Christ. They wanted to proclaim the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why this place was established. They had a desire to bring people to Christ. How many people know who C.S. Lewis is? Quite a few of you do. He's one of the 20th century's greatest Christian thinkers, theologians. Here's a quote. It is so easy to think that the church has a lot of different objects, education, building missions, holding services. The church exists for nothing else but to draw men unto Christ to make them into little Christ. Did, did you read that? The church exists for nothing else but to draw men unto Christ. When this place right here was established, that was the purpose. That's why it started off so well. That's why it continued. If it ever dropped at any time, it's because people forgot this right here. They forgot the, the church's primary goal, and that is to draw men unto the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's what, that's what happened with this church. Not this church, Church of Sardis. I think that's what happened. They had forgotten why they established that church. They forgot why they were there in the first place. And they were just compromising. In verse 2, Jesus said, wake up. All right. Wake up! Now, if you read the original language, it did have intensity to it. So when he said this, that's, that's how he meant it. He didn't mean to read it calmly. Wake up! And strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Now one thing I will say is uh, normally I don't use the King James Version. I use the English Standard Version. But in this particular verse I like the King James rendering of wake up. Because a better translation would be to be watchful. So he's saying be watchful. And strengthen what remains is, and is about to die. Christ is reminding the church that a past reputation may not keep them from death. Remember, he said, y'all have a reputation. 
for being alive, but you are dead. He was giving them a reality check, if that's what you want to call it. He was reminding them of this past reputation was not going to keep them from dying. A stark reminder to the church is that it does not exist for the past, it exists for the future. And it goes back to that very point of drawing men unto Christ. We can't do anything about the past, can we? We cannot change one thing about the past. But where do we have the ability to change things? Right now and every day forward. That's where we have the ability to do things. What we do in the future is within our control. Remember, we're a hospital for the sick, not a museum for saints. Jesus is telling them that their good deeds do not translate into a spirit-filled life. The Israelites were chastised numerous times for their lack of conviction. Did you know that? There was a lot of times where they were doing all the recommended sacrifices. They were going to all the required feasts. They were doing everything that a good Jew was supposed to do that was by the book, but they had no conviction of spirit. And God chastised them for it. It's because they were just going through the motions. They were punished, sometimes very severely. But going back to verse 1, and Jesus having authority, Jesus is basically telling them, I have the authority to shut this thing down. You know, that's what Jesus is telling us today. He's got the authority and the power. If we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing in the name of the Lord, he has the power to shut this thing down. He has the power to come in here and shut these doors. And he will leave the church. If we will not honor his spirit, if we will not honor his word, if we will not honor his name, he will shut this place down. He will remove his spirit from this place. God forbid if that ever happens. But Jesus says, I have the authority to do these things. Verse 3, he says, Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I come against you. Now, there's three things that Jesus talks about here, and he mentions. Remember, keep, and repent. He said, remember what they had received. Does anybody remember what that was? Anybody know what that was? What did they receive? The gospel. Amen. When this place was established, what did it receive? The gospel. When we have visitors who visit us for the first time, what should they receive? The gospel. Let me hear it again. That's right. That's what it means. Good news. Good news of what? Jesus Christ. Jesus said, remember that. You received that and you heard it. Remember it. And then he said, keep it. Another way of putting that is obey it. How tough a time do we have with that? We might remember what we receive, but what about obeying it? Sometimes that's another story, isn't it? We have a tough time with that. We fight with the flesh. But Jesus says, remember what you've heard. Receive it and obey it. And then he said, repent. Now, you all know what repent means, right? Turn around. Turn around from what? Your sin. It means turn around, go the opposite direction of where you were going. He said, repent. And then he offered an ultimatum. If you will not wake up, then I will come like a thief and you will not know what hour I will come against you. Now I've told you that Jesus' words carried weight more than just speaking words. There was meaning behind his words that normally included the city. And this is one of those instances 
The city had a couple of uh, historical blunders on its resume. Whenever the city was threatened, now they, the city was in the, the lower part in the, uh, in the valley. But whenever they were threatened or felt like uh, war was imminent, they would retreat. They had this huge hillside that was 1,500 feet in the air. They would retreat to the top of this, and it was almost impenetrable. There was no way that an invading army could get in there. They couldn't scale it because it was almost completely vertical. So they thought they were safe. They thought because they were up there that they were safe. And by all means, they were. But here comes a couple blunders. On these hillsides, there was no way to get in or out. Obviously, there was a way to get out. There was no way in. But for invading armies, they couldn't find a way. Now, back in the 500s, 500 B.C., the Greeks were invading this city. And there was a, a, a scout team who was spying. They were trying to figure out, okay, how do we get in this place? Well, they were watching, and there was a watcher who was looking out. And this watcher was, he was leaning over, he fell asleep or something, but his helmet fell off and went down these steep cliffs. Well, these Greeks were watching, and they noticed that this person came down a pathway that was invisible from everybody from the outside. Only the person who was walking on the path could see it because it was so hidden amongst the rocks. And so these Greeks, they saw this. These people on top thought they were safe from everything, and so they let their guard down. Well, can you guess what happened that night? They came like a thief in the night, and they took over the place. A little over 300 years later, almost the exact same thing happened, but this time with the Romans. The Romans came in. We're trying to figure out how do we get in this place. The people in the city were scared, and they were gathered on top of the mountain and said, we're safe. Nobody's going to get in here. Guess what happened? Same thing happened. Somebody dropped their helmet, and there was a spy team watching, and they saw this person go down this little invisible path, and guess what? What happened that night? They came like a thief in the night and took it over again. Jesus is saying about the gospel, remember it, keep it, obey it, and repent. Because if you don't, guess what? I'm going to come just like those armies, and I'm going to take you like a thief in the night. You won't even know that I even came. That's a scary thing for a lot of us to think about because when something like that happens, you feel helpless. When you're taken by surprise, you feel helpless. For anybody that says that they know the Lord Jesus Christ, they should never feel helpless. But yet there are some who do. We should take notice, and we should remember what we have heard. We should obey it, and if there is sin, we should definitely repent. But there is a little hope here. Jesus says, yes, you have, you still got a few names in Sardis. People have not sold their garments, and they will walk with men white, for they are worthy. This simply means that they are pure. That's what white means in the Bible. You can trace it. White means purity. Doesn't mean perfect. But it means that they're pure. And then he says in verse 5, he says, The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. To me, that is such a hopeful verse. Because so many times... I think in our life, we've, we've been like this. We can insert ourselves in this story of this church, and we've been like that. Sometimes we felt helpless. Sometimes we felt hopeless. But to the one who conquers, we will be clothed in white. And we have this promise that our names will never be blotted out of the book of life. 
And when I can assure you that when God makes a promise, He intends to keep it. Do you understand that today, church? I don't see many heads nodding. When God makes a promise, He will keep it. Do you understand that, church? Well, we should act like it. We should not look like a hopeless and helpless church. We should look like a helping and hopeful church. One who shares the gospel, who shares that good news with any and everyone who may listen, or even those who may not. But we have this great hope that Jesus will never blot our name out of the book of life. But another thing that I find great hope in is that He will confess us before His Father and before the angels of heaven. For a brief moment, put yourself in the heavenly realm. Think about God's great throne. Think about the myriad of angels. Think about that for a moment in your mind. And then think about Jesus standing there with you and saying, Father, this son or daughter of mine is a workman approved. Think about that. Is that not exciting? The static is not exciting. But the thought of being confessed and justified before the Lord Jesus Christ, before God, the creator of everything, imagine that. I'm guessing Satan thought he should try and uh, throw some static this way because I was saying something that he didn't like. That's all right. Technical difficulties will come and go, but the name of the Lord is forever. Amen? Amen. Well, on that note, Jesus said, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Today, I'm telling you, church, you better remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said. If you don't do what He said, if you don't believe it, if you don't receive it, and you don't go out and do it, guess what? He's going to come like a thief in the night and take you out. That's a good answer. Straight from the mouth of babes. Let's not be this church that we've just talked about. Let's, let's not be the church of Sardis. I'd rather be like the church next week, the church of Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love. Y'all read up on Philadelphia, not the U.S. city. You might be disappointed. Is there any Steelers fans in here? I wouldn't admit that. <laughs> Church, we have uh, a great responsibility. This church was established on the foundation of the gospel. The death, the resurrection, and the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this church was established on. That's what this church needs to stay established on. If we can do that, this church will be here until the Lord comes back. Amen. Amen. Let's go out and reach, reach the world with the gospel. Can we do that? Let's do it. Let's stand for a closing prayer. I'll go ahead and bless the food.